Good evening again. It is a good evening. Deuteronomy chapter 21. Can you believe it? Wow, I gotta blow the dust off Deuteronomy. It's nice to get back into the swing of things, the routine. First John, I'm looking forward to this Sunday, verse by verse. Deuteronomy, Wednesday night. Boy, we've had a lot of things going on. Praise God. I pray you are busy about the Father's business in your own personal life. If you're not busy here with us, amen. There's a lot to do uh, because our Lord is coming quickly, amen. What are we doing in Deuteronomy? You might be wondering tonight, amen. Uh, it's written to Israel. It's uh, repeating a recital of the law what are we doing in Deuteronomy as New Testament New Covenant Christians well if you're flipping to Deuteronomy for the first time tonight be blessed God is teaching his people Moses is pouring out his heart as a pastor as a mediator as a father uh, having walked with Israel their entire journey both the good parts and the not so good parts Amen. So he's pouring out his heart, instructing Israel as they're preparing to enter into the promised land, how to live well, how to walk well, how to enjoy the life that God has given and is giving his people. The inheritance, the blessing, the directions are all in Deuteronomy. Amen. If you've been with us, you know that and you should be saying amen really loudly. Amen. amen. And amen. The directions on how to, well, walk in God's blessing. And we have seen along the way so many um, very practical applications for our Christian lives today. And so it's just a blessing, even in a chapter as weird as 21. You've had like six weeks to read this ahead of time, right? Right? That's a church joke. Uh, uh, read ahead because you always know where we're going to be as we study verse by verse through the scriptures, but as we've had a long time to read chapter 21 of Deuteronomy, I'm sure you know it quite well, but we'll study it nonetheless. Pray for us. We're so excited that finally, it's been 10 months since we've uh, moved into this new facility and we're continuing to make it home. Uh, our hearts are set, are fixed on those who aren't able to come, those who are still sick at home. I pray you never forget their faces, but so they can stream the service live with us. And, and so pray for that. Very soon, we pray, we'll be able to do that. Uh, who's seen the new website? Raise your hand nice and high. It's awesome. Uh, if you don't think it's awesome, just, you know, fill out a comment card and give it to Pastor Tony after the service. I think it's wonderful. But keep all that in prayer. Let's go to the Lord. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. It's just good to be back, Lord, to Lord, just a regular routine of things. We thank you for the Wednesday night crew. We pray that as, Lord, a consistency is seen, that this group would grow back up, Lord, that uh, uh, your people would come to seek you midweek, that they'd come to spend time with their brothers and sisters, Lord, and find connection and support and fellowship accountability, God. We pray that those who are here tonight would, would start tapping people on the shoulder and saying, I'm coming to a Bible study tonight. We're in Deuteronomy. Deuter what? That's weird. Yeah, come check it out. Lord, grow back up Wednesday night and just increase, Lord, the good fruit here. Lord, as we look toward children's ministry just beginning again on Wednesday night and just lots of good things as we come out of the summer. Lord, into the fall, the winter, the new year. God, just bless Wednesday night. Bless our ears. God, touch our hearts. Give us a, a focus for this time, we pray. And above all else, just uh, increase our hunger and thirst to hear the voice of your Holy Spirit. God, this isn't an intellectually uh, stimulating time. This isn't just an emotionally moving time. This is, Lord, precious space and time set apart to sit at your feet, to hear and receive your word, to be built up, to grow, Lord, and to go and do what you've called us to do. And so grow us tonight, Lord, would you receive, God, all attention and focus, and would we leave with, Lord, uh, a lot, a lot of what you've said, Lord. We're looking forward to it, so we've got our pens and 
pencils and some paper or a bulletin, Lord. We'll write in our Bibles and take some notes, God, but we're ready to hear your voice. Lord, we're here for you. Come upon us. Bless your people, Lord, the people that you love enough to give your life for. Bless these saints. Bless your sheep. Feed them tonight. Be honored and glorified. In Jesus' name, let's say it together. Amen. 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 Verse 1, chapter 21, book of Deuteronomy. Moses is just continuing on, rattling off the law, seated in front of some two to three million people, and it's amazing they can hear him without a microphone. He says this, verse 1, chapter 21, If anyone, if I were you, I would underline anyone, if anyone is found slain, lying in the field, in the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess. It's not yours, it's his. He's giving it to you, and there's some accountability required. We can relate to that, I pray, as God's people today. Moses says, if anyone is found, a dead body, slain, lying in the field, in the land, not yours, the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess, and it's not known who killed him. Here's what you do. Then, verse 2, your elders and your judges shall go out and measure the distance from the slain man to the surrounding cities. Why? We're establishing jurisdiction, as it were. You can write that down. Verse 3, and it shall be that the elders of the city nearest to the slain man will take a heifer, specifically which has not been worked and which has not pulled with a yoke. It's pure it's innocent as it were. It's not used and abused. It's not your worst, but it's your best. The elders, verse 4, of that city shall bring the heifer down to a valley with flowing water. We'll see why that's important in a moment, which is neither plowed nor sown. And buckle your pew belts. They shall break the heifer's neck there in the valley. They shall kill it. Verse 5, then the priests the mediators of the Old Covenant at this time, uh, the priests, the sons of Levi, shall come near, for the Lord your God has chosen them. And we've discussed why previously. He's chosen them to minister to him and to bless in the name of the Lord by their word every controversy and every assault shall be settled. They're the ones that God has chosen to stand before him on behalf of the people. They're the ones who stand before the people on behalf of God. Here's what they're going to do. Verse 6, all the elders of that city nearest to the slain man shall wash their hands over the heifer whose neck was broken in the valley. Then they shall answer and say out loud, our hands have not shed this blood, that is of the person that they found, nor have our eyes seen it. I love verse 8. Provide atonement, O Lord. Underline that. Provide atonement, O Lord, for your people Israel, whom you have redeemed, and do not lay innocent blood to the charge of your people Israel. And God says through Moses, listen, and atonement shall be provided on their behalf for the blood. This person who was killed, who was murdered, as we'll see shortly. So, verse 9, you shall put away, I would underline this too, so you shall, by doing so, you shall put away the guilt of innocent blood from among you when you do, underline that too, when you do what is right in the sight of the Lord. Amen? If anyone's found slain, not by natural causes, but it's obviously murder. We've covered this previously. In fact, we'll reference Numbers 35 in just a moment. Uh, in regard to murder, someone being killed uh, with, with malice, with, with uh, intentionally, premeditation, so on and so forth, accidental slaying, and every other such thing the Bible addresses. But what do you do in this circumstance? This person has obviously been murdered and maybe their body's been tossed in a field uh, where no one might see someone comes across. Well, an investigation is what's required to determine the cause of death. And if you can't come up 
with the culprit, the person whose blood would be spilt, the murderer, the one who's killed this person. If you can't find them, you don't know who done it, as it were. You, O Israel, you elders, you judges, must rise up and do something. For firstly, and I like this, God says if anyone is found slain, every single life is precious to the Lord our God. Isn't that great? Red or yellow, black or white, we're all precious, the song says, in his sight. I love that. It doesn't matter who you are or where you're from or what language you speak or what time period you live in. God loves every single one of us the same. Every single life is precious to him. If anyone has found, the Lord says, Moses declares here, You must rise up, you elders, you judges, establish jurisdiction as it were, but get up and do something. Because life is precious to the Lord, but blood spilt in your land that I've given you belongs to me ultimately as something that I take very seriously. The Lord says and reveals here. Turn to Numbers chapter 35 as we said In this chapter, and you can go back and read it more thoroughly, again, understand the law as God is giving it to his people. But in regard to, as we said, murder, both premeditated murder, accidental manslaughter, the Lord says you need to deal with this because it's serious to me. The Lord tells them what to do, but we read this in verse 33 of Numbers 35, by obeying me, by doing what I'm telling you to do in regards to when someone dies, so you shall, read it with me, so you shall not pollute the land where you are. He says, for blood defiles the land and no atonement can be made for the land, for the blood that is shed on it, except by the blood of him who shed it. Therefore, do not defile the land which you inhabit in the midst of which I dwell, God says. For I, the Lord, dwell among the children of Israel. You've got to take death, in this case murder, very seriously. uh, Because you're my people. I dwell in the midst of this nation. There's a lot of parallel that could be made for we Christians, not necessarily Americans, but we Christians today. For we are the community of God. We are the church, the bride, the body of Christ. We are the kingdom of God, as it were. Even still, there's a coming kingdom. Let's not confuse that theology. Amen? So God says, I take this very seriously. So you elders, he says, verse 2, you judges, get up and do something. And this is what you're to do. And, and I just like that. Press the pause button for just a minute. I just like these elders. I like these judges. Verse 2 and verse 3 and 4. And they're still around through the rest of the section. Uh, if it's in your area... Uh, if, if you see that something has happened and you're an elder, uh, you're an older person in the Lord, you've got authority, you make judgment calls in regard to certain situations in other believers' lives, get up and go fulfill your responsibility. I'm glad we're starting a, what do I call it? I love the name of it, that 50-something ministry. <laughs> what is it again? One more time. Prime timers. I love that name, prime timers. You prime timers. It's prime time to come together and start serving the Lord. Why? Because most of you in that category and in this fellowship have been walking with the Lord for a while, and you have opportunity more than that. You have obligation to serve the Christian community. What are you in church to do if it's not that? Amen? You elders, you mature individuals, I just like that. If that's you, you better be doing something. Amen? An opportunity is going to arise. The Lord is going to call upon you, and you're going to engage in service. Probably not this specifically, but... Amen? And did you read this with me? Probably not this specifically with the heifer and all that, as we'll see in a moment. Not exactly, but something in a... (laughs) New Testament, New Covenant sort of 
scene and setting scenario. But the elders, the judges, are to rise up. They're to go out and establish whose opportunity it is to serve. They're to bring the heifer down, slay it sacrificially. And because the Levites, the priests, the sons of Aaron, are the only ones who can administer a sacrifice to God, they're involved also. And, and I just like this. I like the seriousness in which... Uh, Israel is taking and God is telling them to deal with their sin. Every single sin is a serious issue to God and to Israel. And if they did, we read that twice in this section, if they did what the Lord would call them to do, does and did call them to do, then God's blessing would be with them as we'll see shortly and the blood will not be required of them because they did nothing and all because they took sin seriously. I like that. That's important for our generation as we'll see again shortly. If they did what God called them to do and yet yeah, took work and it took sacrifice, literally. But if they did what God called them to do, then the guilt was covered. The sin was dealt with, and God's blessing would remain upon the whole land that He had given to them, all because they took sin seriously. They were to sacrifice, as it were, this young heifer. The priests were to come and facilitate the process. All the elders, verse 6 of that city, <clears throat> shall answer and say, and this is Good for a devotion tonight, tomorrow morning. Give it a little more consideration. They shall answer and say, Our hands have not shed this blood, nor have our eyes seen it. We don't know what happened, but we're taking this seriously. O oh God, through this sacrifice that you've provided, that you've pointed us to, provide atonement, O oh Lord, for your people. Israel. We have investigated this situation, but we couldn't uncover the culprit, the murderer, and, and so therefore we're innocent of this crime. Don't judge us because of the blood that was spilt on our watch, in our house, on your land. Cleanse us, O Lord, from our sin. We take this seriously. We take responsibility because this is our house. This is our community. This is our country. This is Israel. We've sinned Thank you, Lord, that you've provided a substitutionary sacrifice to pay the price for this sin. We're cleansed, even though murder's taken place in our midst, we're cleansed because, God, you've been faithful, you've been merciful, and this animal's paid the price for that sin. Provide atonement, O oh Lord, through this sacrifice that you've prescribed us to make. Two points if you'll write them down. Really important for us. Firstly, only God can provide atonement. Isn't it interesting the deals that sadly we make with God in regard to sin? Oh God, we say sometimes foolishly, hopefully in our past and not our present, amen? We try to make deals with God in regard to forgiving, pardoning, atoning, cleansing us from our sin. I'll do this or I'll do that or God, give me this, but don't, you know, give me that, spare me from the other. It's important that we note here, only God can provide atonement. And with that, atonement is only provided by a prescribed method or means. And that is recognizing that God is the only one who can forgive sin. God is the only one who can provide atonement. God is the only one who can say, I accept that. I forgive you. That covers you. Or in our case as Christians today, that sacrifice washes away your sin completely, entirely. God is the only one who can provide atonement. Not a priest, not a pastor. Not another Christian. Do you think, you know, God will forgive me? And sometimes people say in the kindness of their heart, they're trying to spare the feelings. Yeah, I bet he will. We get into trouble. I've done that. 
Only God can provide atonement, and atonement is only provided by a prescribed method or means. And that is here, substitutionary sacrifice, but what, not whatever Israel could find, or whatever they came up with, or whatever another person might tell them to do to make up for their wrong or their sin. God says, this is the only way you can atone for sin in my country. I'm the only one who can uh, 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 accept an offering, provide atonement, say you're forgiven and it's legit. And this is the way, substitutionary sacrifice. And we've talked a lot about the old covenant. We've talked a lot about the blood of bulls and goats. I mean, all the way, Leviticus, what did I say? Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, we're rehashing some of these things. We've gotten to know, especially in Leviticus, the symbolism behind substitutionary sacrifice. And God said it from the start. The blood of bulls and goats cannot take away or remove or cleanse sin. But it's important to understand the precedent because it points to Jesus Christ. How would the concept of a, 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 a substitutionary sacrifice of one, our Savior, Jesus Christ. How would that concept ever be understood if not for the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, the law, and substitutionary sacrifice? God's people, and, and even we as God's people, were well prepared to embrace Jesus Christ. There he is, John the Baptist said, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Not who covers, and it's got to be dealt with at another time, but the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, it's perfect, it's beautiful, it's good theology. In this case, it's the substitutionary sacrifice of the animal, the young heifer that's pure and undefiled. The priests are involved, the elders come, and it pays the price of that sin. Ignorant or otherwise, it pays the price. Its death covers that sin in which no one knew who to blame, who should suffer, who should pay the price. That animal paid the price for the sin, and God could provide atonement for his people and say, yes, I will accept that. For we Christians, and of course today, the new covenant, the new deal that God made with mankind, the old one is dead and gone. Good luck if you try to pursue any works-based uh, uh, atonement for your sin today. It doesn't work anymore. Read the book of Hebrews. Amen? Listen to the messages. They'll be up on the website, I'm sure, at some point. As we recently taught through it. <clears throat> but in the New Deal, a better covenant God made with man, it is the blood of Jesus Christ, the substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, that God says... All right, okay, I accept that. Your sins are atoned for. You are cleansed. You are forgiven. But nothing else will do. Amen? Amen. I like how seriously God is teaching his people, telling them to take their sin. This is vital for us today. And look at it negatively, if you would, for just a minute. Not doing what God told them to do when there is no atonement for sin uh, judgment is on its way. Not only is the blessing of God removed, but judgment is on its way. And we've covered this in many places in our study, our journey through these five books of the law thus far. Judgment is being stored up. Judgment is on its way, both individually and nationally. And that's why Moses is teaching. That's why these things are written. When you get into the land, do well. This is how you enjoy the life, the land that God is giving you, by taking sin seriously. If you do, you'll be blessed. If you don't, then you will not be blessed, and judgment is coming. For me personally, nationally, for the nation of Israel, and, and I think that still applies to us today, take sin seriously. Come in the way that God has prescribed that we come. He's the only one that can provide atonement for sin. Say, yes, I will forgive. I am God. I am the Almighty. I will pardon your sin. I will forgive you by these means. And for us, we look nowhere else than the person of Jesus Christ. Amen?
So an interesting passage, very relatable to us today. Verse 10, this is another uh, fascinating passage, and I wonder if you, you had some discussions about this as you read these things over in preparation. Six weeks at least of, of probably not that long, preparation for Deuteronomy 21. This is interesting. Read with me now. Verse 10, Moses continues, God says, When you go out to war against your enemies, and they will, they're about to, and the Lord your God delivers them into your hand, and you take them captive. I just love that statement. Pause there for just a moment. I love that it's a when. Uh, it's just beautiful to me. Amen. When you go out to war against your enemies, and the Lord your God delivers them into your hand. When the Lord your God, it, it's going to happen. It's a guarantee of God. And relate that to this first section. Take this writing in context. God says, when you take sin seriously, you're going to walk in my blessing. This is the general, write that down, the general guarantee of God. And it's the same for us. Generally speaking, when you take sin seriously, when you're walking uh, with the Lord appropriately, when you're abiding in the vine, when all is good as it pertains to what the Word of God says with your life as a Christian, then the general blessing of God is going to fall upon that life. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing to be in the world, but not of it at all. Can you relate to that? Do you know what that's like? We live here. My address is, you know, what it is here in the world. I'm in it, but I'm not of it. I don't look anything like it. I have skin on, you know, those kinds of things. <laughs> but I don't exactly talk the same. I don't sound the same. I don't do the same things that the world does and says it's okay. I take the law of the Lord. I take the word of God seriously. And when that's the case, well, the general blessing of God falls upon our life. Specifically, individually, God does different things at different times, doesn't he? Look at Job. Jeez. But God was doing something specific for a reason. It was a season in this guy's life, and the same is true for we Christians. We're not teaching a, you know, a health and wealth and prosperity kind of theology here. There is a general blessing, a guarantee of God. I'll be with you. I'll go before you. I'm going to fight for you, take care of you, protect you. Didn't Jesus say every one of those things to his people? He did. Generally, specifically, well, God may be doing something in your life. And if that's the case, hang in there. Continue to take sin seriously. Continue to walk obediently. And like Job, you'll come out the other side and you'll be so much more blessed than you were before. Amen? When you go out, the Lord says, to war against your enemies, and of course, the Lord is faithful. The Lord your God delivers them into your hand and you take them captive. Think this through. Paint the picture, uh, tell a story, watch a movie in your mind for just a minute. And you take them captive, and you see among the captives a beautiful woman, and desire her, and would take her, dudes, for your wife. Here's what you do. Then the Lord specifically commands his people, this is the law of God for Israel, then if this is you, O fella, O dude, then you shall bring her home to your house and she shall shave her head and trim her nails. She shall put off the clothes of her captivity, remain in your house, and mourn her father and her mother, because no doubt they're dead, they were killed in the battle, a full month, 30 days after that. You may go into her and be her husband, and she shall be your wife. And it shall be, verse 14, if you have no delight in her, after that 30-day period of purity, as it were, we'll get to that in a minute, then you shall set her free, but you shall certainly not sell her for money as a slave. You shall not treat her brutally because you have humbled her. Interesting. Firstly, consider the history. Consider the culture that existed in the world at this time. Consider the practices of all these Canaanite cultures that surrounded Israel that they were going to go in and conquer and destroy and every other such thing. This is an amazing principle considering the culture at this time. It was radical. It was unthinkable to show this kind of respect, mercy, as we'll see shortly. 
You've seen, no doubt, a, a war movie or two, fellas, in your time. Maybe you ladies, too. I don't know. But, of course, you can imagine, if not, the culture at this time, very barbaric. Um, men wrecked havoc, took what they want, killed everyone they could. I mean, it was a brutal time period. Um, you can imagine, for a moment, uh, on the battlefield, men generally, uh, as, as we can be... Um, pig-headed jerks the next section will reveal us to be and that's covering it nicely uh, uh, rape pillage destroy murder uh, uh, take captive women to be slaves at best uh, let alone uh, uh, oftentimes what would go on at at worse the culture the community at this time brutal no one would ever think of doing what God is telling, commanding his people to do here. This is what the world does, but this is not what you're going to do as my people. You're going to do things a little different. If you're out on the battlefield, you, you take captive some, some ladies, as it were, you see a beautiful woman, and you would like to marry her. Here's how you go about that process. Nothing else is permitted. And if this is the case, here's how that relationship, that marriage, will find the blessing of God. Assuming, I'm sure, that she's willing, she's about to have to shave her own head and trim her nails and so on and so forth, so maybe that's an assumption on my part, but I see that here. <laughs> Crazy as it may seem, it may have happened, history doesn't tell us for sure, but assuming that she's willing, you shall bring her home, verse 12, to your house, and she shall firstly shave her head and trim her nails. She's to be purified. God goes on to say that she's to be humbled. And in essence, this represents a fresh start. You know, the past is gone. Things are starting afresh and anew right now. So firstly, she's to be purified, as it were, humbled. Secondly, we see here, She's to shave her head, trim her nails. She shall, verse 13, put off the clothes of her captivity. She's to have a, a change of allegiance, as it were. Her identity uh, previously is gone, and she's now an Israelite. She's a, 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 one of the chosen people of God. There's a change in allegiance, as it were, secondly. And then thirdly, and this one's important as well, I think, she shall mourn her father and her mother 30 days, a full month. There's to be a break from the, the past relationships, the past associations that she's had. If she's going to start afresh and anew and become a citizen of Israel, this country, this community, grieve for this time period, a full month, 30 days, and that's important. And after that time, the Lord says... 30 days of purity, and it's important that we understand this here. After 30 days of listening to her mourn and grieve and wail, that's kind of a, a dude joke, a fella, a fella joke there. Very quiet. After 30 days of grief, she's mourning her family, her parents, whatever the case may be. After 30 days of purity, after 30 days of grief and mourning, if you still so desire to make her your wife, you may then do that. And I like this. That will help you determine compatibility, as it were. I like that. Take 30 days, the Lord says. 30 days of purity. She's got a process she needs to go through. That's healthy and important for you. And if at the end of that time, if you determine that you'd like to go through with this wedding, 30 days of purity, determining compatibility, well, go for it. She can be your wife, you shall be your husband, and it's all good, as it were. But if you change your mind, verse 14... Uh, here's what you're to do. You're to set her free with dignity. Um, and the Lord says specifically here, set her free. You certainly shall not sell her for money as a slave. You shall not treat her brutally because you have humbled her. You've taken her through this process. And so I like that. You're to set her free with dignity. And again, the elevation of women at this time in this culture 
uh, 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 this is unbelievable, it's unheard of, that anyone uh, would act in such a way as the Lord is prescribing his people to behave here. Uh, the mercy, the dignity, it's just amazing. Amen? Some might look at this passage and say, well, that's brutal. You know, uh, go back a little bit. Shave her head? What? She has to do it, not the dude. She does. Trim her nails? I, I, that's crazy and, and, and so on and so forth. That's brutal. That's barbaric. I think this is more <laughs> progressive. I think it's more <laughs> positive. I think it's more, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, what's the opposite of like brutal and barbaric? Civilized. And someone says, that's the word. Civilized. Then how we behave today, 30 days of purity, that would be nice. This is how the Lord says in this strange situation that you determine compatibility, 30 days of purity, and there's a process that you have to go through before any sexual activity. That's important. We don't see that very much today. We are so sexually dysfunctional, not just in the world, but in the church. And 30 days, 30 days, one week, couple of dates, it seems. This is how we determine compatibility. Let's get together. And then if I like you, I'll keep you around. But if not, I'll kick you to the curb and move on to somebody else. We don't talk about it. And thus we okay it. And it's not okay. It's not right. I like this. I think there's a lot that could be said in this passage. But primarily... I think you can pull that wisdom from the Lord devotionally. But I will say that to the one who might declare this brutal or barbaric. We're much more so today. Uh, because we refuse to view intimacy and sex for what God says that it is. And it's more than just a physical act. Amen? I like that. At any rate, give it some consideration before the Lord. I think there may even be some parallels for our young people or single people to follow. Verse 15, moving on, different section. Uh, but this is the one about pig-headed, uh, 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 carnally-minded, idiotic, lunatic men. Still talking to dudes. Ladies, take a breather. We need a lot more law than you do, apparently. Verse 15, if a man has two wives, one loved and the other unloved, and they have borne him children, both the loved and the unloved. And if the firstborn son is of her who is unloved, then, God says, it shall be on the day he bequeaths his possessions to his sons that he must not bestow firstborn status on the son of the loved wife in preference to the son of the unloved, the true firstborn. You dog. Don't you dare. I like that. Amen? Because this is what we do, and this is oftentimes who we are, dogs. We'll develop this in just a moment. God says, this is my law for you. If a man, it's not good, it's against the law, as it were. Polygamy was outlawed in Israel. But nonetheless, if a man has two wives, this is the reality of those relationships. And if he's tempted to do this, you speak up. You don't allow. Don't you dare, God says to such an individual, such a man. But he shall, verse 17, acknowledge the son of the unloved wife, because he is as the firstborn by giving him a double portion of all that he has. For he is the beginning of his strength. The right of the firstborn is his. This is the law for Israel. And yet, as every good law, it reveals the uh, waywardness and pig-headedness of man. Amen? Amen. Of course, polygamy was really common in the culture at this time, not permitted for God's people, and a really dumb idea. For those who would say such an indictment is legalistic, I would say in regard to polygamy, it's not an issue of legalism, it's an issue of lunacy. Amen? 
And we've got many examples that prove that point biblically. I'll say it like this. If a man has two wives, he's got problems. And with every case that we see in Scripture where a man has two wives, what does he have? Problems. And this is why. Jesus said, Matthew 6, 24, you can write that down, Matthew 6, 24, no man can serve two masters. The context there is between man and God, and that's important. No one can serve God and mammon. No one can serve God and himself, as it were. No one can serve God and yet seek to serve himself and chase after wealth and money and possessions, and we all relate to that. Uh, the balance of, well, I got to make my retirement account or my 401k fat and I got to work and, and yet I'm here to live for the Lord. And so we're balancing oftentimes, juggling the two gods in our life. Nothing wrong with money. I pray God blesses you incredibly so you can bless his ministry. Amen. Amen. Nothing wrong. But the Bible says it's a root of all kinds of evil. It's not the root Let's not misquote it, of all evil. It's a root of all kinds of evil, and by it many pierce them through, themselves through with many sorrows. This is a point that God makes that Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. You can't serve God and possessions, God and money, God and mammon. It's not going to work. You think that it will. I do. Oftentimes we're deluded when it comes to sin. We're deceived. Surely... A man can serve God and himself, God and money, God and possession. Surely we can do that. God says, no, you can't. You're either going to hate one, love the other. This is essential that we understand this truth, this theology. It ha it's how it is in life. Accept it. Reject it at your own peril. But the same point is true in regard to marriage. Amen? Amen? <laughs> If a man has two wives, he's got problems. Why? Because as God says, we can only devote our affection to one thing, one person. You can't devote your affection to God and to another idol, a little something-something on the side. That, that's just not going to work. Why? Because you're not able to do both. I have 100% of love. I, I've got a cup of love, 100%. <laughs> right? And I'm only able to give that to one thing, one person. That's my wife. Now listen, I only have 100%. I don't have 150%. I don't have 200%. If I had 200% of love or whatever, I could give 100% here and 100% here. But I've only got 100%. 100% of my love to God and to nothing and no one else. 100% of my love to my wife and what's left over? Nothing. If I were to choose to invest my love in someone else, what am I doing to the one I've devoted myself to, my wife? Taking that love away. You do the math. 80% 80 80 I'll give to my wife. Wife number one, the one I really like. And 20%, I mean, do the math, think this through. It's, it's really practical. But either way, neither wife will be happy because I'm not fulfilling my vow because it's impossible for me to love them in the way that is required of me as a husband. We're all with that? Yes? Now here's where this gets really tricky. This is important. This is great theology. God is speaking uh, biblical truth, realities about life. But here's where it gets pretty sticky. We still think something else today. And we do it in really subtle ways, especially as men. Let this principle set us straight and let us never be suckered by sin again. It's not just outright adultery. Well, I can love my wife and then give some love to this other person on the side. No, that's not going to work. You have 100% of love and it's to go to your wife and no one and nothing else. Well, I'll give 95% of my affection, my love to my wife and 5%, you know, to pornography or to uh, an emotional affair with that girl at my bank or the woman at work or 
whatever it is, chatting online, everybody's doing that these days, and we say, what's the problem? The problem is you're giving affection somewhere else, so you're shortchanging your wife or your husband. You are not loving them as you committed to, as God has required you to, because you're investing that affection somewhere else. I only have 100%. And it's to be completely given to the God who loves me and the wife that he's graciously given me. I cannot <laughs> do anything else because it just doesn't work. Somebody is being abused. And I pray you understand that. Husband or wife, single people, wake up. Anything less is abuse. We've got a loved one and an unloved one. And if I invest my affection in anyone or anything else but my wife, well, at that point, what is she? It's not going to work. We need to be careful. Husbands, bring home 100% of your affection to your wife. If you're giving it, else, uh, uh, it out elsewhere, you are shortchanging her. Don't think, don't delude yourself that you're loving her. Don't bring home flowers and saying, well, I'm going to make up for... It doesn't work that way. One will be loved and the other is unloved. We can't, we can't do it any other way. It's how this thing works. And so in regard to this, you know, often practiced sin of polygamy, this would often be seen. Shortchanging the one, preferring the other, firstborn, wife as it were, and God says you're not going to get away with this if a man has two wives. I'm not okay with you marrying two women, but if a man has two wives, make sure that he's fulfilling his obligation. Make sure that he's honoring his true firstborn. Amen? There's a lot there that you can look into in your own personal time, and I pray you do. Moving on, verse 18, almost done with the chapter. Moses says, If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and who, when they have chastened him, and underline that, chastened him, disciplined him, trained him, will not heed them. Then, here's what you do, verse 19. Then his father and his mother shall take hold of him and bring him out to the elders of the city, to the gate of the city where judgment is made. And they shall say to the elders of his city, this son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. Listen, he's a glutton and a drunkard. Verse 21, then all the men of his city shall stone him to death with stones. So, verse 21, here's the point, so you shall put away the evil from among you and all Israel shall hear and fear. No doubt. Amen? It's like that story with Elisha and the, the young boys who aren't young boys at all. In fact, they're young men and they gave him a hard time and bears came and ate him. You remember that? The story uh, uh, went around many circles, and it, and it and inspired uh, 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 fear, a good, healthy fear of the Lord. So, too, this is the case with this law, this point, this principle. Now, firstly, uh, I think, interestingly enough, our first inclination is to picture, is to imagine like a young child, and that's just not the case. We're dealing with most likely not even a teenager, but a person past the point um, uh, who has reached the age of accountability, who is able to make choices and set the course for their own life, a, a, a young adult, an adult as it were. And look at the sins that are made mention of. He's a glutton and a drunkard. You're not going to see a five-year-old, an eight-year-old at the local bar kicking him back. Uh, amen? You're dealing with an a, 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 a adult here, a young person on the edge of adulthood as it were. Mom and dad have chastened him. It says specifically here, they've trained him, they've taught him, but he just will not heed them. He refuses to walk in the way that God has taught and instructed his people Israel. He rejects, 
as it were, the Lord. He's to be put on trial. That's what we see here, verse 21. Verse 19. You bring him out to where the elders, the judges meet, and he goes on trial as it were. Mom and dad say this. No doubt the dude or the lady can say that. But note here that there is no private sort of mom and dad stoning that's taking place here. It's to be brought out into the open. Mom and dad say, this is the deal. He rejects the word of the Lord and Israel and every other authority in his life. And So what do we do? This is an issue, and write this down if you would, an issue of community preservation, not of parental frustration. You better be careful, Johnny. I'm going to bring you out to the elders, and they're going to stone you. Ah! It's an issue of community preservation, not parental frustration. And interestingly enough, as you look into the history of Israel, and, and, and there's a lot there, um, this or tradition teaches us that this was a law, a principle, a policy that was never really enacted. Um, quite possibly, as it's said here, that it was enough of a deterrent uh, to avoid this at all. And I thought that was kind of interesting. But if this is the case, they decide not to do as God has told them to do. They're going to go a different way, do their own thing. Well, here's what you do. You remove that cancer from the community. The rebellious one, the defiant one, who says, I'm going to sit right here in your midst and do my whatever I want to. And I'm not going to listen to anybody. You are to remove that infection that leaven from your midst. We see much of the same thing, though a little bit different in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 in regard to removing willful, defiant, rebellious sinners from the midst of the church. If they want to persist in that sin, you're not going to stop them. You're not to stone them. But you can remove that leaven from the midst of the church uh, uh, Christian circles because a little leaven leavens the whole lump. That's the point. And that rebelliousness, that defiance, that lack of obedience is going to spread. It's going to spread like cancer. It's going to spread like wildfire. And so it must be removed. And that's most likely the point here. Amen? Two more verses. We're done. Lastly, Moses says, if a man, and this is interesting as well, if a man has committed a sin deserving of death, and he's put to death, and you hang him on a tree. God doesn't say, hang him on a tree. He says, if, which was common at the time, if a man has committed a sin deserving of death, and somebody puts him up on a tree, you kill him capitally, and you hang his body on a tree for all to see. It's the ultimate punishment in regard to culture or ancient Israel. It's the worst thing you could do to a person. Worse than death, as it were, historians tell us. You kill the person and then suspend their carcass up on a tree for the birds to pick on and, and for, you know, everyone to see. Look upon their nakedness. Look upon their shame. It was humiliating. Worse than death, one historian said. If this is the case, here's what I'm calling you to do. Again, the call for mercy. And this is interesting, of course, because as you know, it points to Jesus Christ. God says, if this is the case and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain overnight on the tree. They would leave them there for weeks, according to culture. As far as my community is concerned, God says, His body shall not remain overnight on the tree, but you shall surely bury Him that day, so that you do not defile the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. And here's the verse. Here's the verse that, that Paul quotes in Galatians chapter 3, as we'll read in just a minute. Here's the reality. Uh, he who is hanged is accursed or cursed of God. Flip to Galatians 3, verse 10, and we'll be done. The parallel here that Paul quotes 
in accordance with this theology, this truth, this reality as, is, as it concerns God and the culture, the community of the day. Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Criminals, so on and so forth. Paul says this, verse 10, Galatians 3. And the passage is so important. He's comparing um, the reality that we Christians are justified by faith in Jesus Christ as opposed to uh, the works of the law, trying to be good enough to get the approval to gain the atonement that God can give. It's absurd to think anything we could do would be good enough to gain the forgiveness, the atonement of God. And so Paul's talking about that here, Galatians 3, very important. And he says this, verse 10, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it's written, Cursed, uh, and we've read this previously, cursed is everyone who does not continue in all the things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Guilty we all are, because we can't continue perfectly uh, without sin in the law of the Lord. Christ, we're cursed because we can't continue. Verse 13, yet Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it's written, Deuteronomy chapter 21, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. That verse 14, the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through what? Faith in the one who took our place and bore our curse. I'm cursed of God because I can't, never could, never will, continue in the works of the law perfectly. To miss the mark, it's called sin, and the wages of sin is death. I'm cursed of God to die. And yet, enters our hero, our Savior, the captain of our salvation. As we said previously, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, He became a curse for you and for me so that we might uh, receive the blessing of Abraham's justification by faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Powerful picture, important truth. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. We thank you, Lord, for all the truth therein. Beautiful, perfect, wonderful. Lord, continue to speak to us as we give you opportunity, as we discuss these things with others, Lord. God, uh, thank you for a wonderful evening of worship, God. Uh, thank you, Lord, for just declaring, God, truth about life and, Lord, about, uh, most importantly, our relationship with you in this chapter. Lord, thank you as we saw it at the beginning and we see it again at the close. God, we're just guilty, Lord, and yet you've provided the means by which we might be cleansed. But only, Lord, if we'll come to the one who can provide atonement, just you, it's just you, and we'll come with and by the means that you've pointed to, that you've prescribed. And as the book of Hebrews says, chapter 1, right there at the beginning, that God has spoken in all sorts of kinds of ways in the past, but in these last days, He's spoken to us by His own dear Son. It's all about Jesus. And we're thankful for that. We're thankful for the one who hung on the tree, who hung on the cross, who bore our curse that we might not die and be separated and be cursed of God. He took our curse, our punishment, our chastisement, the wages of our sin upon himself. Thank you, God, for making the gospel so simple that it's all about the Son. It's all about Jesus. Lord, help us to take that gospel tonight and just enjoy it afresh and anew. It's not about what we do, it's about what you've done, and that should compel us to do a lot for you. And help us to take it, Lord, and share that good news with those who don't understand it. Maybe they think they do, but they don't. There are so many would-be Christians bound up in the bondage of legalism. God, help us to take it and share it so simply and set them free. 
the letter kills, but the Spirit is life. Help us, Lord. Send us out as ambassadors of your gospel. In Jesus' name, bless your people. We say amen, amen and amen. God bless.